Half the species on the planet have no brain to speak of at all, but they manage to survive and move around very well and very effectively. So what we've done is we've tried to evolve things from the bottom up. And in the process, we have not yet evolved brains, but we have managed to evolve very effective nervous systems. Self-organizing systems such as neural networks can yield remarkable results. Carl Sims made a software program of small cubic creatures that were able to evolve. Those that moved the fastest got the right to procreate. But there was always random change built into their program, into their genes, so to speak, in order to make them evolve. And Sims watched the strange creatures that appeared on his computer screen. He also let them compete for a green cube. Then, something extraordinary happened that wasn't programmed. One of the creatures jumped over the green cube and attacked its competitor before going for the cube. Evolution had produced a creature that was the most able to compete, and therefore to survive. It was just a software program, but one that organized itself. One day, very powerful computers may surprise us. First, we say that if a computer could play chess, then it would think like us. And then we get a computer to play chess, and we say, that's really not thinking. And the answer is that we don't really know what thinking is. I would argue that machines do a pretty good job right now at thinking, and um, they don't do as good a job at creating, although we don't really know what creating is. And they don't do a very good job at having a soul, but we don't really know what a soul is. But when we can define it, they do a pretty good job at doing it. I'm not like Aw, you say he loves me. I love you too. If we give machines a body, if we build embodied entities, if we let them right from the start being part of a community, if we make them learn interacting with us, learning to distinguish between themselves and the environment, learning to then automatically things like love and stuff like that will emerge. A baby, a newborn baby, doesn't have those values at all. It learns it by interacting with its parents, its family, and its, its community. Is it love that these robots will learn once they become intelligent, or will they turn against their creators? And historically, uh, humans don't do well living side to I side with other things that are human-like. One or the other survives and the other goes away. We don't do well in cooperation. 500 years ago, when humans entered the new world, it was not a good outcome for the natives. And I don't expect as we enter this newer world, this brave new world, that it will be pleasant for the losers. And um, the winners may be some transhuman thing. But the loser, losers, or the typical inhabitants of the last 500 years, won't be treated well, because that's not been the history of man, going all the way back to what happened to the Neanderthals when the Homo sapiens arrived. They didn't live in cooperation, even though they're very similar.
My worry is that if artificial intelligence is allowed to um, develop entirely separately from us, and if it develops a lot more quickly than we can alter our biological bodies, then it may become vastly more intelligent, more wise than us, and uh, we'll get left behind. And personally, I don't want to be left behind. I'd rather be up there with the most advanced creatures. If we don't want to end up obsolete at birth, if we want to stay the most advanced beings, there seems to be only one solution, to become robots ourselves. Whether we like it or not, we're becoming cyborgs. We're becoming transhumans. Transhuman is an evolution from human to post-human, where we're no longer exclusively biological. So the cyborg is having all sorts of add-ons. Are we walking around naked? No, we have clothes. We have eyeglasses. We have earplugs. Now these are very, very basic, early add-ons to our biology. We're also having much more innumerable add-ons, prosthetic parts inorganic hearts. We will see much more advanced prosthetics in the years to come. Eventually we'll have entirely prosthetic bodies. Human as a design is a wonderful design, but humans as a design have some faults. One fault is we were not designed uh, for the modern age. The industrial age has equipment moving faster than we are, and equipment that's very large that crushes us. So we were designed with an endoskeleton, meaning our bones are on the inside, with our soft tissue on the outside. Uh, the world would be better for us now if we had our bones on the outside, like an exoskeleton. So we were like a beetle. Post-human, I think, will be post-biological. Um, by that I mean that it'll be a gradual process. There won't be any sudden transition to a different form. I think we'll gradually integrate more and more technology into our bodies. We'll be replacing our organs with, with more efficient organs. We'll gradually replace this, this neural tissue because it dies off after a while. It's easily subjected to chemical damage. So eventually I think we'll replace our brain cells with um, essentially computerized parts. It'll be much more efficient, much more powerful. To become cyborgs able to compete with the rapid evolution of computers, we first have to understand how our own brains function. The research in this area has boomed in recent years. One of the factors behind this is the development in scanning techniques. They are now at the level that enables us to observe individual nerve cells at work in living animals. In living so is this dying out here? Or I mean, no, is no. that a it's in the process of, of growing in. The technique is based on fluorescent jellyfish. Dr. Lichtman isolated the gene responsible for the fluorescence. He implanted it in mice and continued his experiments until he had a mouse of which only the brain cells were fluorescent. They're genetically engineered so that these are now heritable strains of mice. We have a yellow mouse strain, we have a blue mouse strain, we have a mouse strain where only a few cells are labeled, and we're now generating mice that have multiple colors in them. We call them brainbow mice. With this technique, we can see individual nerve cells make connections with each other and emit signals. It's really quite jaw-dropping. It's beautiful uh, when you look inside and see these uh, nerve cells that have always been there, uh, but never easy to see before in living animals. This technique is used now by many laboratories, helping in their efforts to understand how the brain functions. Other scientists use a completely different approach. They take the brain cells apart and let them grow in a small dish on top of a computer chip. The problem with this technique is that it is extremely difficult to place each cell exactly on the right connection point. A team of researchers at IMEC has recently found the trick. They printed a pattern on the chip with a product that the brain cells love to eat. While consuming the product, the cells get stuck to the right spot and their tentacles are guided by the pattern. This way, the whole network of brain cells can be entirely controlled. Some scientists have already been experimenting with such brain dishes. Their chips were less precise, but their results sometimes remarkable. Let me disconnect the light show. 
Dr. DeMars, for instance, tries to communicate with his brain dishes and teach them several tasks. So each of these dishes contains about 20,000 or so neurons, which are firing away as we 